hope you had a great week. I've had the best week ever. Um, uh, I know it's just been an amazing and most, uh, it's a refreshing week for me. Uh, um, I just love the season we're in. Uh, if you're now new here or maybe back from vacation, you haven't been here in a couple weeks, um, I want you to know that uh, today we're just, we've been praying for you. We're so excited that you're here. And um, if we haven't met, I'm Dave. I'm the pastor here. This is Good Soil Church. Welcome. But uh, my heart is just so full looking out at a, a full outside patio, a, a full uh, living room and kitchen, and everything is full. And it's, it's incredible. And um, I just love seeing people come back into 2023, um, just wanting to press into God's presence. And that's what we're all about. And so um, he did so many incredible things in 2022. And and I don't have a recap video for you. I'm sorry. I don't have like, you know. But there were so many baptisms and salvations and, and lives being changed. It was just an incredible year. And uh, we capped it all off with this amazing Christmas service in 50 degree weather. And it was awesome. We, we decided to have a baby born during service <laughs> at the hospital. And uh, she's here with us this morning. Sienna, beautiful. And, and we got to visit them last night um, at their home. And it was just amazing to pray over that baby and be with them, and what an amazing family. Um, but I just think God's just getting started. It, it's fun. We're in, in, in our first year as a church, and and then you come into this day, and it's full. And you're like, wow, okay, God, what are we doing? Like, how are we doing this? This is incredible, and it's it's what we always said. We wanted organic growth, just we wanted life change in this place, and we wanted to do it the way the New Testament church did it. And we studied Acts for a while about uh, how... It just grew and grew and grew. It was because people were meeting God, and their lives were changing, and there was nothing else to do but then to keep pursuing God. And so that's our goal with each of you. So it was an incredible time of worship. I hope you enjoyed that. I don't know what your history and, and worshiping God is, but uh, but that's what we're going to do. Every, every single Sunday, we'll open with uh, four songs of worship just to, to settle our hearts, to reposition our hearts to worship God and, and allow Him to then speak into our lives. Because one thing that we want to be as a church is a priority of worshiping first. Um, putting the name of God high and turning our attention to Him. Um, because what you put first is what's most important to you. I think you guys can understand that logically. So whether it's your job, the vacation you're looking forward to next year, um, your family, maybe a hobby. We, we live near the boating capital of the world, and so maybe it's a hobby. But hopefully it's God. And so our goal is to show you that putting God as the first priority in your life um, is going to change everything. So this priority of first is really important. It shows you what you value, and God sees what you value. And God has a lot to say about first. The Bible is actually a, an entire story of first. And so uh, I want to give you a couple scriptures today to show you that God is very serious about what is first in your life. And uh, so first I want to point you to Matthew 6.33. All right. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So Jesus here, in this statement, is in the midst of this thing we call the Sermon on the Mount. You might have heard of it. Matthew 5-7, through 7, the book of Matthew. You should go read it on your own. It's incredible. Greatest sermon ever given, because it was given by Jesus, right? So, so it was given by him. And this is a little point inside of that whole long talk that talks about our reliance on God. And it'll fix everything and all your problems. You're like, well, how is that, God? Like, how are you going to fix everything? Well, he says this. He gives some examples. He says he, uh, he feeds the birds, and they never ask for it. He clothes the lilies, and, and they're beautiful, but how much more would that God want to clothe you? How much more would he want to provide for you? How much more his children that he loves would he want to give to? Right? And so he says the world chases after stuff, like grinding. We're going after things. We have our side hustle. We're trying to build the big business, right? The world does that. They try to do it on their own, in their own desires, but they don't put God first. They put that desire first. And then they're left feeling anxious and stressed, and how am I going to do this? And, and that's not how God's people were supposed to function. How we were sp supposed to function was to put God first as a priority, and He's going to take care of the other things. It does not mean we don't work hard. Actually, God's people should work the hardest in the business. God's work, people should show up early and leave late, because God's people know how to work, but... But we're not relying on the business to provide for us. We're relying on God to provide for us. And it's amazing how this promise of God comes with a blessing. When you put Him first, there's a blessing on it. And I want to point to another scripture. It's in Genesis 4. Everyone knows the story of Cain and Abel. You've heard that story. 
But I, I don't know if you fully understand Cain and Abel um, until you read this. It says this, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked on favor with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. So we see here that these two men both brought an offering to God. But one did it in the course of time. Kind of his leftovers. Whatever I got. You got that, God. It's for you, right? The other, God, uh, Abel, God honored Abel's gift because he took a, a leap of faith bringing his best and his first. And in this agricultural culture, it was a big deal to bring your first, your best sheep, your best lamb, the first. It shows us that God does care about the order of things. And so God doesn't just want us to follow this order of first. He himself, because it's a priority to him and a principle of his, he actually follows the principle of first himself. Let me show you that. He decided when he had to sacrifice something, he would bring his first and his best. Romans 5a tells us this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God offered his firstborn son, his best, so that he would be sacrificed for us so that we could have eternal life. God values the first so much, and he believes in it so much that he actually participated in a priority of the first. He gave his first, so why would we not? You might say it this way. This is how I want us to think. Let's be an able kind of church, not a Cain kind of church. Always bringing our first, always bringing our best. A church that gives God our first, and this is a church that I want to be where we bring the first of our time. We show up early, we leave late, we, because we love being in this kind of place, in the small groups, and serving when we serve outside these walls. Let's get there and give God our time. Let's give them um, our talents. What are you good at? How, how's God going to use you and use you in the business world to, to, to change you know, people's lives and to give back and, and to, to change things around this community? And maybe your resources. Like, What are you clinging to that God needs you to open your hands and release? And that's exactly what we're doing during, during 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're giving the first of our year to God. So we're currently on day 8 of 21 days of prayer and fasting, if you did not know. Uh, it's just been amazing. It's been really the best week ever. Um, if you've not been able to make it out to one of our mornings at 6 a.m. this week, uh, you're missing out. Because I'm telling you, there's something incredible happening in this church. After last Sunday's message, I sent an email. I usually send it on Tuesdays. But I sent an email just giving some instructions for the next three weeks, just so people knew. If you weren't here, you could get the email. And I said, hey, we're meeting at 6 a.m. tomorrow. And I, I, I sent the email, and I, I promise you, I, I did not know what to expect. I, last year, we had like 10 to 14 average. We had some low days, you know, some days that it was, it was fun to see a lot of people walk in. But I didn't know what to expect. And, um, and I woke up uh, a little bit early, like 5.15, get everything ready. We had coffee brewed. And, and at 6 a.m., I'm like, all right. And all of a sudden, the door opened. And two dozen people walked into our house at 6 a.m. in the dark. Um, on a Monday, just ready to give it all to God. And then we spent an hour just praying, worshiping, seeking God. And it was so powerful. And without a doubt, it was one of those powerful hours of my life. Like, because I didn't know what to expect. And God blew my expectations out of the water. And um, as, your power, as your pastor, it kind of just wrecked me, like, in a way of, like, oh, like, what we're doing and what God's doing through that is making a huge difference. And, um, and I just love to see people take a, a step with God. It's, it's so powerful to see it. It's really my boldest prayer, and my, most, like, my, my greatest desire is to see people take steps and draw closer to God. And that's why we do this whole thing. Um, and the rest of the week just continued to amaze. We had the same amount of people every single day. People were just drawing close to God, and, and you could see that they were learning a lot by how to pray. We were teaching a little bit at the beginning about 10 minutes of teaching right at the beginning, just so you knew what we were focusing on that day, how to pray, and it was just so powerful. And so, we have two more weeks, 14 more days of doing that. And um, I would encourage you um, to come out 
commit to at least a day. Come out to one of these days of this, these prayer meetings, 6 a.m. Uh, on the weekdays, 7 a.m. on Saturday, and then 9 a.m. on Sunday. We did that this morning. And just commit to seeing what a New Testament prayer service looks like. Where everything's out, and God, you're just, you're just going to meet our needs. You're going you're gonna to move in this place. You're going to change this community. You're going to do all those things. And it's just one full of power, His presence, and I promise you, it will change you. It changed me this week. God has answered so many prayers this week. And I'm just so excited to see what he's going to do the next two weeks. I, I, I'm not limiting what God can do. I'm like, that was a lot of answered prayers. I'm going to keep praying because there's more of that we need to see. And um, such an exciting season. And it's so fun to see people praying and seeking God. Maybe some people for the first time. I've talked to some people that are like, I've never prayed before. But this has been awesome. You're right? And that's, that's our feeling. We want that feeling all the time. And sometimes I feel like we're holding back from jumping into like a robust prayer life because we just don't understand prayer or how to pray, depending on our background, it's like, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, you just like, I don't know. Like, what do I do, right? And so uh, I decided today, on this Sunday, to take the rest of our time together and teach us about what Jesus thought of prayer. Like, our Lord of Lords, King of Kings, pray. And he taught a lot about prayer. And so we're going to teach today about what Jesus taught about prayer. All right? And so, uh, like I said many times, we want to model our entire life... Um, for Jesus. Like, like Jesus, I want to be like you. I'm never going to be able to be like you, but everything you did, I want to try to do that. Why wouldn't we do that in prayer? So, we're going to learn about Jesus. So, my first question for you, and this uh, this is a really interesting transition. I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> it's like the Holy Spirit fire is just changing the slide every time. But um, I hope it's not too distracting. But um, how did Jesus pray? How did he pray? Did he have a method? Did he have a model that we should follow, that we should emulate? Did he, people ask questions about that? Well, they did. Um, I believe he was very clear about prayer. And it may surprise you, for all of my people who have traditions in their past that aren't the same as the tradition of what we're doing here, um, this might fly in the face of some of your traditions. And I don't mean to offend you, but I mean to correct how maybe we've done things for a long time. Um, First, let's look at an example of Jesus praying uh, from Mark 135. This is one of, this is one of my favorite verses. Uh, you'll see why in a second. So, very early in the morning, very early in the morning, uh, while it was still dark, that's before the sun, um, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. We see here that Jesus clearly was an early riser, right? Uh, and uh, so, for my, my non-morning people, Right? With some of you? Amen. <laughs> Turn off the TV and go to bed early. That's my advice for you. Danielle and I were night owls for the longest time. We thrived at night. We got she built an incredible business working till one in the morning. I I was in the fellowship in these long hours and I was a night person. And we did that for years and years and years. And we realized now having five children. That if we want time with God before these incredible gifts of the Lord arise and let us know that they're present in this world, we have to get up before the sun rises. We have to. So we had to go to bed earlier. There was no way to get up earlier, but not shorten the night. Like There was no way that was going to work. We're going to be so sleep deprived. So, so we decided to do that. So there's just something about the early morning. If you've never, uh, that was funny, I was working uh, at a church, and there was a young guy on staff, and he had to be there early for setup one day, and I kid you not, he showed up, and he said to all of us, he's like, there was water on my car, and we're like, what do you mean? He said, there was like this, like, I don't know, did it rain last night? I don't know, it's like, no son, that's due, and that's on your car every morning, before the sun hits your car. And he's like, it's incredible. <laughs> he was 28 years old, had never seen dew on his car. Something's wrong with that. So, um, so something about getting up before the sun. So I go to work at 6 a.m. when I go to the day shift. So I leave here at 5.30. And it's beautiful. It's like dark. Uh, it's usually cool out, even in Florida. It's kind of cool that time of the morning. I roll the windows down. It's quiet. There's not a car on the road. The sun's not there. And you just... It's peaceful. And you're just realizing, man, this is 
those refreshing morning hours you hear about in the Bible, those times with God that these guys were seeking out. And there's an expectancy of the, in those hours of what the day could bring. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but you know, you, you can get up and, and you can think about, man, God, what are you going to do this day? Like, what could happen today? Uh, but you can only appreciate that when you have the, the time to soak it in, right? Like, you have not just the right before the sun, and then you're like, oh, that's great, oh, the sun, right? Like, have some time to sit in that moment and appreciate before the sun. Well, the opposite is also true. If you snooze your alarm three times, you're woken up to kids shaking you, and everything's crazy, noises and gongs and bangs, and we're late to work, and our kids are half-dressed, and we're trying to drag them off, but all that stuff, no one eats breakfast, like we get something in the car, I don't know what it is, right? It does the opposite to our spirit. There's no expectation for this day. It changes how we walk into a day, and honestly, it's hard for God to work in that day. It's chaos. God does not appreciate chaos. God is a God of order. And, um, and so, we've all been there, though. Because I have five kids. Like When we accidentally like snooze it and get woken up, everything in our spirit, even if it's still quiet, even if it's still early, we're like, man, we missed that moment that we can have with God, that 30 minutes, whatever, 20 minutes, just with us and God, that there wasn't the distraction. Um, and Jesus knew that. He knew he needed it. So he went away in the early morning before the sun rose so he could get that. Because I think um, for us, we need to know that quiet time with God is the time where God's going to speak the loudest. Uh, we can only function at our best when we've met with God and then step into our day. We'll function at our best. We can function the other way, but at our best. And uh, so that's why we set the times early during 21 days of prayer. It was intentional because of the scripture. Jesus did it. We're going to do it. And it's not always easy to get up early and get over here. And we live about 20, 20 or 30 minutes from some people. We live two minutes from other people. But again, let's get up and get here. Um, Jesus left early to spend time with his Heavenly Father, and our goal in life should be to model that same behavior. Anyone who's ever let, read a leadership book, what do they say? Get it all done before everyone else gets up. Right? That's the leadership. It's from the Bible. It's Proverbs. And it's Jesus' story. Like, they're just stealing from the Bible and not telling you they're stealing from the Bible. So, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to pray like Jesus prayed. So how do we do that? Well, if we look back at that verse from Mark, we see that he got up early while it was still dark, and that meant before the sun came up. And I was thinking about it. We visited Mount Vernon this summer. And uh, George Washington's home is still standing. It's pretty amazing. He died in that home. Um, he raised like this in incredible like uh, farm that he had. He rode the entire farm every single day. But we were walking down from the bedroom that he died in, down this, this secret staircase down the, the back side of the building, and it went right into his study. And the tour guide said that he actually had a pedal underneath his, uh, his, uh, his desk that fanned him from above. Like, so he pedaled while he wrote, and it fanned him. So, really cool guy, George Washington, like, amazing man. But the tour guide said this. He said that Washington arose, the reason those stairs were built was so he could go from his bedroom to his study without having to see anybody. He was in his study two hours before the sun rose every single morning of his life that he was home. And the reason was, and quote, so he could read his Bible, he could pray, and he could write letters to friends around the country, which would probably be kings, you know, they would be like all these like really famous people, before the sun rose. And his famous quote is this, it says, I will never let the sun catch me sleeping. Isn't that awesome? What a great quote. I mean, that's just, that's, that's just a quote for me. I just love that. Like, it ain't going to catch me, son. I'm going to get up before you, right? So and I just love that he knew that it was important. He knew it was a priority. And there's just something about seeing the sunrise. If you've never seen the sunrise, some of you might have never seen the sunrise, um, and having accomplished something before that moment, you'll probably accomplish more in that time than anyone will the rest of their day. And it just gets you back up the next morning. Once you've done it, and you've gone to bed early, and you're like, oh, Maybe there's a reason for this. You're going to get up and do it the next day. You'll get a routine. Um, but the time you start praying is only one aspect. Remember we said got up early, right? It also says he went to a solitary place and he prayed. 
And I just want to say quickly that maybe you need to change your place. Get up and go somewhere. I don't know if it's the backyard, I don't know if it's in your car down the street, I don't know. Maybe you need to change where you pray. Because sometimes we get complacent in the thing that we're like, the, you know, we come into this living room or, or you know, I'll walk outside, whatever, and sometimes I'm just like, man, I just need to go for a walk down the trail. I just need to go do something, right? And so um, I believe Jesus was constantly surrounded by people who had needs, had wants, were demanding of him all the time, disciples with silly questions that they should have understood, but we don't understand it, so we're not going to be harsh on them, but, but he, it was probably overwhelming, even for the Son of God, to just be bombarded all the time. He could not connect with his Heavenly Father in that moment, so why wouldn't he go away, get equipped for the day, and then come back to the chaos? The busyness of his ministry life made him know that he had to pull away and get along with God. And I believe for some of us, that's the same thing. The place that you're in, whether it's a home, or family, an apartment, or you know, maybe you, you're getting to work and then you're trying to, in your office, find the quiet time, but you know you're getting the emails, you know you're getting things. We need to change the place. So put God first in your day. Get alone with Him. But some of us might still be wondering, um, how do I pray? And I'm glad you asked because you're in the same boat as the disciples. The disciples had no idea. They, they uh, had been raised as these good Jewish boys, but they had no idea how to pray. Um, because they noticed something different about Jesus, how he prayed that was different than how they had been taught to pray. And when they saw that, they asked him about it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to ask Jesus today, how do I pray? And I believe his response is one of the greatest models of prayer that has ever been spoken. But most of us have missed its power and its ability to change and incorporate itself into your prayer life. And so let's take a look. So it says this in Luke 11, 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. So there you go. He left his house. He's in his place. But the disciples are watching him. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John, that's the, you know, John the Baptist, just as John taught his disciples. So, hey, we're all these Jewish boys. We, we've been praying for a long time, but that's different. John prayed different. There's something different here. Teach us. So we see here in Luke 11, the disciples were observant of Jesus, but never quite got it. So Jesus always had to explain. In a couple months, we're going to do a parables series where we're going to talk about all the stories that Jesus told. But you'll learn in all those parables, they never got it. And then Jesus is like, all right, <coughs> sit down, let's explain it. So that's what Jesus is going to do. And um, they had been raised as these good Jewish boys who recited the Shema, uh, the Shema, sorry, and other memorized prayers. So they could recite a lot of the Torah. But Jesus was doing something different. Even though Jesus, Jesus knew the Torah, he wrote the Torah, but he knew the Torah, he didn't just recite the Torah. And they saw, well, that's, that's weird, that's different, right? So Jesus spent hours in prayer with his Heavenly Father. And any one of us who hears that goes, Hours? <laughs> what do you do for hours, right? Like that's a lot of people would say that. But he spent hours with his father, and his disciples saw a connection that he had with the heavenly father that they wanted. So they asked him about it. And Jesus' response was something that's so familiar to us today that most of us can recite. It. It's the Lord's Prayer. Most of us know what the Lord's Prayer is. And uh, it starts with our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We all know that, right? And I'll be honest, being raised outside the church. This was my first exposure to prayer ever, was the Lord's Prayer. And um, I went to a Catholic high school, and as a kid who didn't know God, and all I really, uh, I never had really attended church, maybe a Christmas service, an Episcopal church, whatever, I was forced to memorize the Hail Mary and the Our Father in both English and Spanish. You know, like, Padre Nuestro, que estas, en el cielo, santificado, sea tu nombre. Like, I could still do it today. Um, that's the Our Father, by the way. That's the first one. But, um, but I promise you, it meant nothing to me as a, a kid who did not believe. I didn't understand where it came from. I didn't understand what it meant. And heaven knows I did not think there was any power in those words. Um, but I said it when I was supposed to say it because I needed to get an A. Right? I needed to get an A. So um, I checked the box of prayer. How many of us check the box of prayer? But that is not what Jesus intended when he told his disciples that. Because he said it twice, um, both in Matthew and Luke. He didn't give them some nice lines to memorize or regurgitate this mindlessly. He was giving them a model for prayer 
a way to pray that would allow them to connect with God in a powerful and moving way. And I believe the church, the big church, has done a great job of getting people to say that and to pray that. But I think they've done a terrible job of teaching them about the power of that. And, um, and being in a Catholic high school, you, you see that. Like, I knew the words, but there was no power. And I think, as we explain it, we'll see that Jesus was saying something more in that that we can, that we can learn from. So I'm going to switch to the Matthew version. because the, the, the Luke version skips a line or two. The Matthew version is the one we would all know. And, um, but it, I'm starting before the Our Father, okay? So this is Matthew 6, 5. Jesus is teaching about prayer in general in the same speech, the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their full reward. <coughs> Jesus says, don't be like those guys who are praying to get attention. Because the attention from others is all they're getting out of it. So if that's what you're going for, just to get attention from others, then that's how you should pray. Well, verse six, 6 says this, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to the Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Like we saw Jesus model in the previous verses, he says you need to go be alone with God. Now there's a time for corporate prayer. And I want to tell you, like, we believe in corporate prayer. We do corporate prayer for 21 days. That there is something about being with the people of God, praying together. There's something in that. And we'll, we'll give a bunch of scriptures in the next couple weeks about, about that. We're talking about personal prayer with God right now. Go be alone with God. Uh, we need to seek him out personally. And finally, in 7 through 8, it says this. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So then there's this line, where he says, God already knows your heart. So why are you trying to wow him in your King James English, or the many, many words you know, you, you came up with the, the alliteration on that one. That was good. God will love that. You know, that, none of that. God already knows what you want to pray. So it's just getting real with God, talking to your Heavenly Father like a trusted friend. And, and you have to understand He wants to communicate with you. And that's the whole point of prayer is communication with God. He already knows your wants and needs. He just wants to communicate with you. So then right after that line, so you have those, those lines He's criticizing prayer He sees in the temple and, and through these people. You have the famous Our Father, right? So the Lord's Prayer. Then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Matthew 6, 9-13. And that's the NIV version. If you, if you switch to different versions of the Bible, there's a little nuance in some of the words. But that's, that's what we pray, right? If you've been raised in any traditional faith, you probably know that. Most of us read it and say, it sounds like a great prayer. Like, I, sh I should say that more often, right? Or, or I heard that as a kid, I remember that. Um, or you memorized it in two languages like I did, and just so Sister Teresa wouldn't smack you <laughs> on the hand and give you an A, right? That's why I memorized it. And so um, Sister Teresa and I had a lot of great discussions <laughs> about faith um, and I, I was very rude. And so I, I, I repent, Sister Therese, um, about uh, how sarcastic I was about your faith. But so um, either way, it's a beautiful saying. It's an incredible prayer. But I believe Jesus meant much more than just us reciting it when he gave it to us. Not just something to quote. So he was not telling them how to pray. Oh, no, he was, he was telling them how to pray, not what to pray. Like, don't just say these words. Pray like this, is how he said it. In both versions, Luke and Matthew says, pray like this. This is an outline for prayer. No matter how or what we're walking through, we can pray this scripture. And so, the disciples were desperate to connect with God and pray like Jesus, and his response was like, do it like this. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to break it down, this beautiful model of prayer, and my hope is that after today, you can implement this model of prayer into your daily prayer life. So, the first thing he opened with was... Our Father in Heaven. And what Jesus does here in this portion of Scripture is He connects with God relationally. 
by calling him Father. Now, it may not seem like a big deal to you being raised in 21st century America, like, to call God uh, my Father, you know. It's a big deal there. To call God your Father in the Jewish culture was a big deal. And uh, Jesus broke that tradition of just, you know, this untouchable, unreachable God when he came to earth. Because one of the main reasons Jesus came was to be close to us. And, and you know, that, uh, that Emmanuel, like God with us, is Jesus. To make God relational. Connect with Him for the first time. And so now Jesus, after sacrificing on the cross, has broken down the veil between us and God. So when we pray this, we should be praying, God, I want to be close to you. I, I want to see you as Father. Like, we should extrapolate that into all the ways that God can be our Father. And so we see it in Romans 8.15. Paul saying this, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear, Rather, the Spirit you received brought about an adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. So instead of just saying, Our Father, like the beginning of the line, just say it. Instead we should pray and pause in this moment and just thank Him for being our Father. I don't know how your fathers were in this room, but if you had an absent father, an abusive father, a father who just wasn't around, a father who didn't know the Lord, like... God wants to be your father. Whether you had a great father, God is the perfect father. And, and we should take a moment to thank him for being that and receiving us into the kingdom. And, and Jesus breaking the veil so we could approach the throne and come to the feet of the father. And uh, this gift of adoption into the kingdom is one of the greatest gifts we'll ever receive. And we should be grateful of that. So we should pause in that moment and reflect on that. Not just skip through it, say to our father, like, you know, it's just one, a one-off, you know? So next, we have this uh, next line, hallowed be your name, Matthew 6, 9. And by saying this, Jesus was pointing out that there's many names of God that all carry power with them. And as you reflect on the meanings of his name, we should worship his name. His names throughout the Bible are there, and I'd love you to go look them up. You can actually Google search it and just write a list for yourself so you have it in your prayer journal and and just pray through the names of God. But some of those are Elohim, which means Supreme One. Think about it, Supreme One. It's amazing. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. There's a really famous song now, Jehovah Jireh. Like, God's going to give us all things. Like, if we press into His uh, our relationship with Him, all things. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Imagine some more peace in your life. Well, God provides that. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Who needs some healing today, right? Like, mentally, physically, emotionally. God will heal that. See, the Lord, and this is Psalm 135, says that the Lord, the, your name, Lord, endures forever. You're renowned, Lord, through all generations. David's saying here that your name, your name is above all names. Those names of God name every attribute of you that we should press into that. So hallowed be your name, God. Sit in that for a few minutes. Name some of the names of God and thank Him for what they've done in your life, those names. So as we pray, we're praying through the Lord's Prayer. Speak the name of God. Speak it over. Like, don't just skip through that. Say the names of God. And it's amazing how when you say Jehovah Shalom and you sit in the peace of God, He'll give you peace. He'll move in that moment. Now, this moment of prayer also, though, should put us in our proper place. Um, sometimes I think we uh, write God off for the day and it's like, but he, if He's active in every moment of our day and He has a plan for our life and you name these names, you're like, oh, wow. You kind of stand in awe of God. You know, like, it's just a moment where you just reflect on how big he is. Um, and so the next line is this. Your kingdom come, and your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And this changes our perspective. Like, a lot of us, when we pray, it's like, man, i got all these things I need to pray for. This changes our perspective and pauses us to take our focus away from ourselves and to pray God's agenda. Pray his agenda first. Because I don't know about you, but if God has a plan for the world, and his plan is best, he even has a plan for my life, and the plan for my life is best because it's God's plan for my life, isn't it the most fruitful and beneficial thing for me to go ahead and say, God, let your plan happen. Like, the plan for the world, the plan for me, the plan for my family, like, let that happen. And to pause and allow us to pray for that to start in our lives. Because I think a lot of us are stagnant because we're making our own plans for our own life. Those weren't the plans that God had for your life. So pray His agenda first. And it, 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 what it does, it actually releases control a little bit. Um, we're going to get to our own needs in a second. But this moment releases control of uh, 
what's happening in your life. Like, God, if your agenda is for me to struggle in this moment to learn something, that's okay. I'm praying for your agenda first, Lord God. And it, it, it really humbles us um, because we want to pray what lines up with God's word. Those are the most powerful and effective prayers. So take some time to pray for God's will to be done. My will is for every single person in this room to know God intimately and to grow passionately with Him and for well intended to be changed and, and for that to just overflow in the community of community, but because of what we're doing here, but I need to pray for that. Not that I want to build something or that I think this would be great over here, but I know God's will is for people to know Him. I'm going to pray for that. And so uh, the next is this. And this is the line everyone loves, right? Give us this day our daily bread. This is our needs, right? God, like... Give it, give it to us, whatever you're going to give it to us, but we, we would like really good bread, right? like really blessing bread. You know? And um, so after we've connected with him personally, lifted his name in worship, and asked for his will to be done, Jesus shows us the Father does desire to meet our needs. Jesus doesn't leave this out of the model of prayer. Um, we have needs in our life, and God wants to provide for those needs. But what this does, you see, give us this day our daily bread, what we're doing here, though, if God's providing the bread for the day, it means he's providing the sustenance for the day, not the new house or the new boat. We're declaring our dependence on God for the day. Like, all my needs, God, I know you can meet those, like the birds and the lilies. I pray for them right now. I pray for all those needs. And um, we serve the creator of the universe, who has unlimited resource, and wants to take care and bless his children which is you. But he also desires to be the answer to your problems. That's where the dependence comes off. We can get our needs met personally with drive, with the great, the right strategy, the right, you know, but God wants to be the answer to your needs. And uh, he cannot bless those who do not rely on him for the blessing. I know a lot of guys who build incredible businesses. And I, I talk to them on the side, and just, they're still striving. They're still... Grinding, and I'm, but I'm looking at them going, man, you're like a blessed guy. The problem is there's no blessing on the thing that they built themselves. God could have built the same thing with them and had blessing on it, and there would have been peace in when they achieved it. And so um, praying for our needs is great, but it builds a dependence on God and breaks the sin of self-reliance. It's a sin that some of us need to break today. God wants nothing more to be than to be your answer and to acknowledge that he brings all good things. James says it this way. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every single one. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. James 1.17. God is generous and will meet every need of ours. So pray for God to be your support, and then pray for his support. God, I rely on you for all my needs. God, can you meet these needs? And list those needs. Like, don't just skip through that line. Like, give us our day, our daily bread and move on. Like, well, like, give us this day our daily bread, God. I, God, I'm leaning into you to provide for all my things. Well, God, I get my family in order. Like, you know, get, get, uh, get my finances in order. Like, well, we need this, God. We need this problem to be solved. Like, those needs. God wants to hear them. But he wants to be the answer. And um, you're never going to overwhelm God, the creator of all things, with your needs. I just want to put that up. Like, God can do it. And um, he always gives abundantly. So the next line that Jesus says is this, and forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Uh, Matthew 6, 12. Jesus here is pointing to the forgiveness of sins that can only be offered after he went to the cross. So it's interesting. They didn't have the ability to forgive when he's giving this prayer. So he's giving a model of prayer for when he leaves. Hey, pray like this when you leave. And they're like, uh, I guess we can forgive. I, I don't... That's a God thing to forgive things. Like, I don't know. Like, so we need to daily acknowledge our need for forgiveness. And so it reminds us like we need to be forgiven and always return to the cross and understand the forgiveness power. On, um, on Saturday at prayer, I opened with just the spirit of repentance that we all need every day. Like we fail every day. So why aren't we repenting every day? It's not like beat you down, but what it is is a, a reordering of, oh man, okay, I, I didn't say that right yesterday. God like, I'm sorry for that. Like, restore my language to how it should be. Hey, God, maybe that business deal didn't go the way I should have. Like, I repent, God. Like, and this is between you and God, remember. Like, this is a forgiveness that we all need to accept. And return to the cross 
and then be set free every single day. So in these prayers, you can be set free every single day. And I say it this way, and this is why. Because only the forgiven can forgive. So from this place of forgiveness every day that we reach because we're praying, then we can freely forgive. And we have to offer forgiveness to others. Um, this may be a time, right now when I'm speaking, where you're like, I don't know, I need to forgive somebody. But, or somebody comes to mind immediately that you've not forgiven for something that needs to be forgiven. Well, if you've been freely forgiven, you are now free to forgive. And you need to forgive. Because unforgiveness is one of the most toxic things anyone can walk with in their life. Um, and when you forgive them, go to the Father and forgive that person to the Father. God might call you to go to their face and forgive them, but that's not where that heart change is. It's to the Father. And it might be one of the most free moments of your life, something you've carried that God never intended you to carry. And finally, he says this, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is when we begin to engage in spiritual warfare in prayer. Spiritual warfare is not a one line. There's a lot of spiritual warfare that needs to happen. So I don't know where you land on this topic, but I'm here to tell you spiritual, a spiritual battle is happening every single day in this world. And we're in the middle of that fight. The moment you gave your life to Christ, you became the devil's enemy number one. Why? Because you are the image bearer of God. And you're here on this earth, and you're speaking now truth to God's word that's going to draw more people into the kingdom. The devil hates it. Hates every bit of that, and he's going to come after you. So every day, you are in a spiritual battle, whether you know it or not. And I said this, this line says we need to engage in spiritual warfare. So how do we do that? Well, you see, this might sound intimidating. I'm like, I'm fighting devils. What are you talking about? Right? Like that's, but know that God has already won the war. And I said this a couple weeks ago. God has already won. He knows the ending. But he never promised that because he wins at the end, there would not be battles in this life. But he's going to equip you for every battle. So we need to be prepared for the battles that are coming every day. Fighting the good fight. Because God's hope is to have as many people in heaven as possible when he wins the war. But not everyone's going. And our fight should be for people, for souls, for truth, for light, and the darkness. And so we need to engage in the spiritual battle. Um, we just The biggest thing here is to acknowledge you're in the fight. So when something happens at work... You know, it's not, it's not a, a devil under every rock, right? When things happen, you're like, that just doesn't make any sense. You need to look at it through spiritual eyes and be like, okay, what, what, is, what am I trying to get thrown off of here? How am I supposed to um, respond to this in a, a godly way? And I'll be honest, I've had some interactions recently at work that because I responded in the right way, in a godly way, life change happened and eternities were changed. I'm going to tell that story in a couple weeks. Because I responded, not combatively, and not like in a way that most of us would, I saw it for what it was. And I engaged in spiritual warfare, and I just you know, sh showered it with salt and light, and just I gave my best to them. And so, um, the disciples, every day, watched Jesus walk away and pray. He went away for seasons of his ministry and prayed. And unlike the religious, regimented, empty prayers that they'd been raised on in the temple... What they saw was connection, power, and authority. They saw Jesus make prayer a priority, but when, they, when he described to them how to pray, he described this model of prayer that was dynamic, could change in whatever season you're in, whatever situation you're in, whatever part of life you found yourself in. And I love that Jesus tore down the facade of this empty, shallow, memorized, recited prayer that we've all done, I mean, I think we've all probably said it. It's a beautiful prayer. You can say the Our Father just straight through. It's a beautiful thing. But we miss the power in it. We miss what God meant by it. We meant the way that it makes us pause in the different moments and sit in the names of God and sit in this idea of being forgiven. And just, wow, I'm forgiven? Because I did nothing? And you forgave me? Like, Jesus did everything? Like, that should just make us pause. And what it does is it draws us closer to God and allows us to connect with His will for our lives. So my prayer for you, as you embark on this prayer journey over the next 14 days, if you've been with us seven days, thank you, but the next 14 days is this time we're giving God our first. The first of this year. We're still in it. Drop the baggage of old prayers I used to say. Drop the baggage of reciting something. 
doing something that you feel like you should do. No, nope, God wants you to do this. And get rid of the routine, get rid of the religion, and press into God's presence in your prayers. And you're going to see God now in a real and powerful way when you pray. Because like I said last week, this will be the best year of your life if it's the best year of your life spiritually. So let prayer become a lifestyle for you. Every day. All day. Get up early. Uh, pray like Jesus prayed. Let Jesus' model not just be something you, you say and recite. It's beautiful to do that. But let it be a beautiful outline to honor God, to connect with Him deeply, to allow your request to be heard, and then to see those around you with empathy and love, and lost, and in darkness. When you pray like Jesus prays, you're going to pray for people to know what you know now. When you get up early, and you see the sun rise, you're like, thank you, God. That hour with you, that 30 minutes with you, where my spirit is settled, I'm going to walk into my meetings today, I'm going to walk into school today, I'm going to walk into all these places today, with the peace of God, because you gave me a way to pray. And I just love that about how we're going to pray. God is doing incredible things in this season of our church. When I look out today, like everything in me is like elated, you know? And uh, and I think it's because we're praying. I think it's because we we gave God our first last year, and 2022 blew our minds. Blew our minds. And we're giving God our first this year, and what he's already done in a week, like, surpasses more than I ever would have thought in the first month of the second year of this year. And I, I, I was telling Mike earlier, I'm like, I don't know what he's going to do all 2023, but I'm not going to limit what God can do. And uh, it's going to be an incredible, incredible journey. Um, I just pray over the next few weeks, you press into God's presence through prayer. Give him your first in prayer. Give him your first and your best. Our best is in the morning. I'm going to tell you, even if you're not a morning person, the end of the day, we're all beat up. Like, we don't have enough words left. You know, like that whole word thing. It, we're not our best in the evening. We're our best in the morning. When we get up, good night's sleep, get up. And I pray that he moves in powerful ways. And that you see that his promises never fail. And through this, through making this beginning of the year our best spiritual start to a year, our best prayer start to a year, our, our best first to God ever, it's going to end up becoming the best year you've ever had. So let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the model of Jesus. We love that he went to the cross and gave everything for us, Lord God. And we receive that today, that forgiveness of our sins, Lord God. But you didn't end it there, Lord God. You then set us on new ground to have new life while still here on earth, Lord God. So we just know that this Our Father prayer, this Lord's prayer, is a model for us to step into relationship with you, to awe and, and worship you, Lord God, to pray your agenda over our lives and over this world, to have our needs met, Lord God, and to be blessed and to engage, Lord God, in, in spiritual warfare. We just pray that ground is taken for the kingdom, Lord God. That when we pray, there, there are prayers that are, are strong and there are prayers that are effective, Lord God. That you work through our prayers to change the world around us, Lord God. We love what you're doing through Good Soul Church, through each person in this room, each family that's represented, Lord God. We pray that we become prayer warriors. We pray for the next 14 days, Lord God, that you meet each and every person who calls Good Soul Church home right there in their seat, Lord God. That you move them to be prayer warriors. You move them to pray knowing you're going to meet needs and you're going to bless those around us, Lord God. We love you. We praise your holy name today, Lord God. And we just pray that this becomes, this 2023, the best year ever because it's going to be the best year we've ever had with you. We love you, Lord, and we praise your name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen.